Well, your feet might be hurting you, and your knees might be hurting you, but there's nothing wrong with the voice. <laughs> Amen. A beautiful, beautiful, powerful thing. And Brian didn't even need the mic. Beautiful, beautiful song. To get. Did a wonderful job playing the piano. And, and uh, I, 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 I wish I had some the voice of some other people sometime because preachers always want to have strong, deep, beautiful voices. And uh, that's not always the case, but uh, you guys really, really were used to God today with your talent. And so was uh, Hunter and Jesse, although they're gone, they, they sneaked out. It's good to see you today. And thank God for a beautiful singing. And Donald, I didn't mean to. Yeah, was there. I probably messed Donald up when he came to sing because after Marion had sang that beautiful song, and Donald walked up on the stage, I said, let's see you top that. <laughs> so that probably blew his mind. <laughs> and I didn't know Brother Ken heard me, but he did. He, he, he lost it. <laughs> so that was pretty good. But we, we're so glad to see Mr. Patrick with us this morning, back, back there. And today I want you to turn to the book of 1 Kings, please, uh, the 12th chapter. I'm going to preach about uh, three men this morning, uh, but I'm not going to preach an hour upon each man. So I want us to look at a very interesting series of events that happened in the Old Testament and also understand that uh, God worked with these three men in three different ways. The first man is Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was the son of, of Solomon. And he did not fare too well in this sequence of events that we're going to read about this morning. Uh, it's amazing. Let me let me just to preface what we're going to say this morning and uh, the background of it, so it may be better understood. For hundreds of years, the children of Israel did not need a king. They were happy with God Himself as their king, and then they begin to clamor for a king. They begin to ask God for a king. They said, "All the." All the other nations have a king. Why can't we have a king? It, 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 it's astounding when you think about it that here is a small little nation that had a lot of chiropractors in it. And the reason I say they had a lot of chiropractors in it is because they must have had them because God was always telling his people, you are stiff-necked people. Hence the chiropractor. But but they they really were privileged and, and God's mercy had shone upon them like no other nation. And they actually, as they left Egypt and went into the promised land, had God Himself with them every single moment. He was he was there in the sanctuary and in the tabernacle as he came down and, and, and showed himself to the high priest in the sacrificial time. He, he was there on the mountain with Moses when he told Moses that you, you'll have to get in the cleft of the rock and I'll show you on my backside. He was there in the pillar of fire at night so they could see which way to go as he directed them and protected them. He was there in the the pillow of cloud by the day to, to give them shade over them so they would not become too hot and become dehydrated and, and he was there to protect them. He was there to even send their food and their manna down from heaven so they could have something to eat. And so God himself, the God of the universe, was constantly with the children of Israel. 
He probably manifests himself to them more than he has anyone else in the scripture. He manifests himself to Moses a good deal. He manifests himself briefly to other people. But this was a prolonged manifestation of the presence of God to the children of Israel. And they did not appreciate it. Can you believe that? They, they didn't even appreciate it. They, they took it for granted. And they asked for a king, a human, finite, sinful man to rule over them as a king. Now, I'm not God, but I would imagine that God probably... I, you know, you, 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 there's a, there's a speculative thought about God and His personality. How much like us is He? Does He get His feelings hurt? Or is He above that? Does that not affect Him in any way whatsoever? He does say, on occasions, I'm a jealous God. And, and I'm jealous and, and I'm an angry guy because you sin. And I don't know the answer to all those queries this morning, but I do know that if God does get his feelings hurt, or if he is offended, I'll leave it in a neutral gear there, and this was an occasion when he probably was offended if he does that. If he gets his feelings hurt, which I do not know definitively, this would have been one of those occasions when I would think that he would have gotten his feelings hurt. They, they rejected him. Uh, you, you know how it feels when, when, when you're rejected? It's not a good feeling. And I think that probably the reason that People suffer a lot of things. Uh, just for instance, if a, if a young man wants to ask a young lady out for a date, many times if you would ask, he might get the date. But one thing that holds him back is the fact that he's afraid of being rejected. Rejection is a terrible thing. And we shared with Barry this morning in Sunday school that if you come to our church, you don't have to worry about being rejected. Uh, we're all in the same boat. We're all in need of help. We all have good days. We all have bad days. Amen. And we always rally around the one that is hurting. And the one that's having a bad day. And the one that is having problems. We can't always solve the problems. But you can be sure that our people will be loving you and praying for you and talking to you and lifting you up and supporting you no matter what you go through. And this is one place that you won't be rejected. Now, I think that's a very important thing. But then they got a king, David. And David went through his reign. Uh, it went good, it went bad, it wasn't great all the time. And then Solomon was appointed, Solomon came. He was blessed in a great and wonderful way by God. And even toward the end of his life, he began to fall away a little bit from his obedience to God. And then it lasted two generations, from David to Solomon, through Solomon. And then, by the time the third generation came into power in Jerusalem, the whole kingship thing was in big trouble. They're just normal, sinful men. They're not God. How can they rule a nation the way that God ruled the nation? And so we see in this portion of Scripture this morning 
the beginning of the holes and the cracks in the dam that would eventually burst and let the floodwaters of sin and corruption and greed and worshiping false gods come roaring in to afflict the people of Israel. Let me read to you this morning after a little background information from the 12th chapter of 1 Kings, beginning with verse 25. Now, if we read in verse 25, we're going to talk about Jeroboam. Rehoboam was the son of Saul. And it says in the 12th chapter, the first part of the 12th chapter, we won't read it for lack of time, that Rehoboam took counsel with the older men that had counseled his father. As the highest to treat the people. Then he took counsel from a group of new young men and asked them how they thought he should teach, treat the people. Well, he did not take the wise counsel from those old men with a lot of experience who had been with Solomon and who had directed and guided and helped Solomon as his father. He took the advice of the young men who were impetuous. And here's what they told him. And here's what he did. The king asked the people in verse 13. 12, 13. The people roughly and forsook the old man's counsel that they gave him. In 1 Kings chapter 13. No, I'm sorry. I'm trying a new technique this morning because... I sometimes get in a big hurry and I don't give you the verses and you have no idea where I am. And I just blew it. I went from 12 to 13 without even meaning to. 1 Kings 12, 14. That's where we are. And he spoke to them at the council of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. They took the wrong advice. And he said, I'm going to chastise you not with whips, but with scorpions. And he was evil and he was he was he was mean to the people that, that were serving under him and he ruled. And they rebelled. They rebelled and he he and a battle, he sent out a he sent out a party of people, and the people rose up and killed those people. Then he flew back, he fled back to Jerusalem, and he said in the scriptures, then verse nineteen. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. A split came between the house of David and the rest of Israel. He flew back to Jerusalem. He, he was in control of Judea and, 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 and Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin was his friend. But the rest of the tribes rebelled against Rehoboam and they split the kingdom. And so a tragic thing happened. And then there's Jeroboam and, and Jeroboam who really was not in the line of David, began to rise in favor with the people of Israel. And in the 12th chapter, verse 25, it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein. And he went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now watch this. Jeroboam has wrested the majority of the kingdom away from Rehoboam and he is already beginning to get into trouble. He said it to his heart and he to think. Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. He's afraid that, that the kingdom is going to return back to Jerusalem and back to Rehoboam. So in his paranoid state, he says in verse 27, 
And if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, that's where Rehoboam was, is verse 27. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So he's afraid. He's afraid they're going to, to turn against him and go back to Rehoboam. And probably in his mind there is guilt because of the way that all this has transpired and the fact that Rehoboam has returned and to return uh, back to Jerusalem. And there's a split in the kingdom. And here's what he did. He was not a righteous man. Two generations removed from the time that God ceased to sovereignly rule over Israel. Look what is about to happen in verse 28 of chapter 12. Whereupon the king took counsel, Jeroboam, and made two calves of gold, and said unto him, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold my God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. <coughs> it, it, it happens over and over and over again. He's thinking the people are going to return to Rehoboam, to the God of Israel. And so he begins to, to, to plot. And he says, well, you know, guys, it's, it, it's too far to travel way up there. You don't want to travel way up there to worship. We can worship right here. And so he tells them, we can just worship these golden calves that, that were brought up out of the land of Egypt. He turns back to Egypt. He turns back to the golden calves and he substitutes them for the Lord God. Verse 29, he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests to the lords to the people which were not the sons of Levi. He desecrated the house of God. He desecrated the temple. He desecrated the law of God. And he appointed sinful men to be priests in the place of the tribe of Levi, which God had ordained would be the priest to try. And that was a serious, serious sin. In Jeroboam in verse 32, ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So that he had built the sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel a priest of high places which he had made. Can you imagine that Jeroboam is so either ignorant of God's ways or he is deliberately flaunting in the face of God to make sacrifices just like God does in the temple to the golden calves to be worshipped. And then there's one thing that God will not tolerate. And that is going after other gods. That is replacing Him with, with false gods and worshiping the creature and a piece of stone and a piece of metal rather than Him. In 33, So offered upon the altar which He had made in Bethlehem the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even the month which He had devised of His own heart, he picked out a book of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Now, when he did this, bad things happened. When Antiochus of Pippides went into the temple in 70 AD, he did a similar horrible thing. He went in, the Roman emperor, having See that Jesus was dead, having no respect for the Jewish God. He went into the temple of God and he sacrificed pigs upon the altar. The worst 
blasphemous thing you could do to a Jew. Amen. Now, how long did it take for God to rain down judgment upon Jeroboam? Well, it appears in the scriptures that it took only one verse. For the next verse, in chapter 13, verse 1, says this. Instant judgment. Verse 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah, by the word of the Lord of the Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Before he even burned the offering, and he was standing by the altar to burn the incense, God sent a prophet directly to him immediately. And in verse 2 he says, And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child is born in the house of David. He goes on and he goes on. But then the important verses begins in verse 4. 1 Kings 13, 4. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God. I want you to notice that it, it doesn't even mention who the man of God is. He didn't send Jeremiah. He didn't send Elijah. He didn't send Elisha. It, and this man doesn't even have a name. He's a no-name no name prophet. And I think many times when God sends us, we also can be no-name prophets or no-name witnesses. For you see, it doesn't really matter who we are. We're not important. The man of God that came was not important. He, he was just the man that God chose, and God was the important one. And I think there's a certain irony because here is a king who has such a high view of himself and so egotistical that he's, he's brave enough and brazen enough to completely desecrate the temple and the altar of God. And maybe even thinking that he can get away with it, that he's that great of a guy, that he's that powerful. But the mighty strong favor of God will come upon every one of us one day and He will judge every one of us when we sin and for what we've done. And here we are with a man that really does not fear God. Amen. He doesn't even think, God doesn't think enough of Jeroboam to even send a great and mighty prophet to rebuke him. He doesn't even know the guy's name. Just an insignificant prophet is coming to rebuke the mighty Jeroboam. Then it says, verse 4, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethlehem, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, now here's Jeroboam at the altar. God is sending a prophet to warn him of what he's doing and the impending doom and judgment. So he takes his hand away from the altar and he uses his hand to command his people to arrest and take away the prophet. Get rid of him. Now that same hand that he raised in defiance against God, and that same hand that he raised in defiance against the prophet, had a very unusual thing happen to it immediately upon that command. Again, he says, lay hold on him, and as soon as he did, Jeroboam's hand, which he put forth against the prophet, Dry it up so that he cannot pull it in again to himself. King James uses dry it up. I think it might have been like a, a paralyzation, but he couldn't pull it back in. He has his hand out in the face of a prophet to rebuke a prophet and maybe kill a prophet, and God just freezes his hand and will not allow it to move. And beloved, let me tell you today, and you all know this, 
that the mighty God of heaven can freeze any man's hand at any moment, any time he wants to freeze it. He can loosen any man's tongue any time that he wants to loosen any man's tongue. He can stick any man's, any woman's tongue to the cleft in the roof of their mouth and silence them any time he chooses to do it. We deal with the mighty God. And one should not trifle with such a God. Verse 5, chapter 13. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Not only was his hand paralyzed, but the altar was, was destroyed, it was split in two, and the ashes poured out on the ground. God stopped Jeroboam in his tracks from his desecration. In verse 6, And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be destroyed again. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing how quickly a person will change their tune when they have to deal with the living God. Here's my Jeroboam. I can do what I want to. I worship calves. I worship goats. I worship gold. I worship silver. And it really is mine. You see, I'm greater than God. Jehovah can't stop me. I worship who I want to worship. And as soon as God intervenes and takes his hand and paralyzes it, he immediately sees God in a different light. <laughs> and isn't that so true with us? One day we were lost, didn't care for God, didn't like God. But when God strikes you and regenerates you, like he did Paul on the road to Damascus, then, then you look at God in a whole different light. Listen to what he said. He is going to strike the prophet in one second, and I think this is a simultaneous act, and it happened within minutes. The next thing he said, after his hand was stiffened, verse 6, and the king answered and said, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me. That's not a very good conviction. If you're convicted and if you're convinced that you're the great king and, and God is nobody, why would you immediately turn and beg for prayer for the God that you are desecrating upon the altar? You notice what he says here. It's very interesting. Look closely. Very interesting. And you may see some shallow evangelism here. He says, Entreat me now the face of the Lord thy God. He doesn't say my God, but he says thy God. He didn't say Please, I, I changed my mind. I, I, I think I believe in God now. Uh, ask my God to come and heal my head. Did he say, Oh, I'm sorry for my sins. Ask my God to come and enter me and save me and grant me salvation. Did he say, I, I think I want to glorify my God now. I'm going to glorify you, God. He didn't say that. He did not even claim God as his own, but he told the prophet, tell your God to pray for me. He's still barking out orders. He's still commanding the prophet what to do. He's still commanding even God what to do. Heal my hand. You can't do this. I'm the great of Jeroboam. And now you've got my hand like this. You've got to do something, God. You've got to heal my hand. Do it. That was his arrogant, conceited 
um, uh, energy. It wasn't a prayer of contrition. It wasn't a prayer of repentance. But it was a prayer and a command. I, I, I think you can't even probably call it a prayer. It was a command for God to do something for him. I think that he probably thought he was still in charge because he's still giving the orders. And he didn't want anything good to come from him. He wasn't depending from who he was worshiping. He just wanted his hand fixed. It was totally about, totally about self, about ego. Verse 6, last part. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again, it became as it was. For some reason, only known to God, God blessed him and he answered the prayer and he healed his hand. And then verse 7, the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. So the king responded from the healing of thy hand and he said, Come home with me and I will give thee a reward. Now, do you say he was going to give God a reward? Did he thank God? Did he admit that God was God? No, he, he wants to give a reward to the man that healed his hand. Wanted to buy his way. And verse 8 says, The man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way which thou camest. So he went another way, and he returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. God told the prophet, don't do these things I've told you. Eat no bread, drink no water, do not turn away. Keep an eye on the prize. And I, I, I think that we really need to keep on thinking that. I, 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 I read about a preacher this week I'm reading a book I won't say I won't mention his name but he went through trial after trial after trial after trial after trial but he kept his eye on the prize and he finished the race and he made it to the end now I'm not saying that that's got anything at all to do with salvation what you're saying there's nothing we keep that's God's word he saves us, we're saved, we'll always be saved, we'll never lose our salvation. But as far as being the best we can be for the Lord God and making the most out of our Christian life in His sight, we need to consciously be aware that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark it looks, no matter how bad it hurts, We've got to keep going and keep fighting the good fight. You know, I'm convinced that being a Christian and being a preacher especially is a war. We are in a war. We are in a war with Satan. And he will do whatever he can to defeat us or stop us. We're in a war with ourselves. We have good days, we have bad days. And sometimes we, 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 we get beat down and we just sometimes do things we shouldn't do. I was really grouchy yesterday. I had to apologize to two people because I, I, I've been sick for two weeks. 
and it got worse and worse and worse. And I was trying to go eight hours in the mall, sit there and suffer so Jennifer could stay in the mall for eight hours. And me and Ramsey went all the way to Pennsylvania, came back. And yesterday morning, I just, you know, sometimes the devil will pull all kind of, he will make things look worse than they are, right? He, if you're having a good day and you're fresh and you're rested and you're prayed up and, and you're right with God, everything's positive and everything looks like it's going to be great. Occasionally, if you get beat down physically or mentally or spiritually or with sickness and it grinds on you and it grinds on you and it grinds on you and it grinds on you, the devil will come in and take advantage of that sometimes. Amen. And you'll begin, you'll begin to put, put things in your mind like you did with, with, uh, with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And you'll look at things that you looked at yesterday which looked wonderful. And today, you see negative things about that situation. And you're grouchy, you're no good to anybody, and your best is being by yourself to get straightened out. Amen. So, you know, it's a constant battle. It's a constant fight. And we're right now unaware of where our yellow bus is. It's been a tremendous struggle sitting a bus on a ship for the first time ever. We've had a horrible time communicating. People won't answer our emails. They won't answer our calls. We've got a company we're dealing with which has one man in charge of the whole company. And he won't ever answer the thing. And he's the only one that can answer the questions. So it's been frustrating. So we know it's in Miami because we had a guy drive it there. Whether it's going to be in Belize when we get there, we don't know. But you know, we can turn these things around to the glory of God. And we can use them for his glory. Jeroboam's faith was not good. I'm not going to read a lot of scripture that I was, but I'm running out of time. So, even this man of God came to Bethel. And there was an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken to the king and then they told also to his father. There was an old prophet, no name, old prophet in Bethel. And he heard about the prophet that had rebuked Jeroboam. So he came and he met him and they went out to lunch. And, and they, they got to know each other. And they became friends. This is a short synopsis of this. And then... And a strange thing happened to him too. He fell also. It's so easy to get messed up and to fail. The old prophet said, come home and eat with me and drink with me and come to my house. And the prophet said, God told me that I can't eat with you, I can't drink with you, I can't go to your house. Now, I don't know what the other prophet, old prophet told him, but probably something like this. He said, well, yeah, if you come to my house, you're going to get steak and baked potato and sugar babies for dessert. And the, old, the other prophet gave in, and he went to his house, and he ate with him. A seemingly innocent thing. Like I think it was, was Uzziah, touched the chariot, the, 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 the trade or whatever it was that was carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and he died immediately. God told him not what not to do, but he did it anyway. It's very interesting. 
It says here, And it came to pass after he had eaten bread, after he had drank, that he settled for him an ass for whip for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, listen to this. A little simple thing. God said, don't eat, don't drink, keep your eye on the prize, do what I tell you to do, and don't deviate. And I'm not trying to preach legalism this morning. I'm trying to deal with obedience and, 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 and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the prophet did not go to the house of Jeroboam the king, but he lit his guard down, and he went to the house of the prophet which was seemingly an innocent thing to do. And what happened? As soon as that prophet left, as he disobeyed God, in verse 24, chapter 13, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And he died. I don't understand all of that. I don't understand why God is so judicious sometimes and handing out his judgment. That's to God for God to, to decide, not us. But I know that the man disobeyed what God wanted to do, and he went out and the lion ate him. It wasn't an accident. I'm sure it was providential that God caused it to happen because this will happen. And says after the lion ate him, the ass just stood there and the lion also stood by the carcass. And even the old prophet went to see it. They saw the lion still standing there and he didn't eat the ass and he didn't eat up the carcass. He just killed the prophet. And that was it. God sometimes is very precise in his judgment. He's very precise in his blessings as well. But then as I close, I want us to return to Jeroboam and see what happened to him. Two more verses. Now, Rehoboam had sinned and he mistreated the people and God sent him back to Jerusalem and the kingdom was split. Jeroboam committed heinous sins and he had the judgment of God placed upon him. The prophet that came to judge Jeroboam and tell Jeroboam what he was doing wrong also disobeyed God and he himself was eaten by a lion. And now I'm going to read some bad things about Jeroboam again. Now I would think that if a person, a Christian, read this portion of Scripture, that they would be able to surmise if God tells you to do something, it probably would be a good idea to do it. If God tells you to do something specifically, if he does, and if you can get to the sermon, and if it's by whatever means, then you should do specifically what he says. And it's probably also a good idea if God tells you to do something, that you don't disobey the Lord. And, and beloved, that can apply to every area of every Christian's life. Every area. The sovereign God is controlling everything in this world. And so, we should be very careful how we deal with the living God. Verse 33 gives an ending statement about the fate of Jeroboam. 1333. 
After this day, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way. He still would not return from his evil way. It's been quite a while since we uh, mentioned Jeroboam. There's, a, there's two whole pages here in my Bible that it talks about the two prophets. Just kind of left Jeroboam hanging. Uh, and you wonder, is he doing anything different? Is he beginning to do right? Is he beginning to see the judgment of God? And then we get the answer in verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people, that means evil people, priests of the high places. My, my dearly beloved, you cannot take the lowest people and make them priests of the highest places. You, you can't take the most sinful, evil people and make them guardians of the most holy places. Levi found that out with the sons. But you need to take people that are righteous and that love the Lord and let them be in the holy places to do God's work. I preach places, whoever, whosoever would, he consecrated them. And he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin of the house of Jeroboam, and the evil had cut it off and destroyed off the face of the earth. So Jeroboam just could not get straightened out. He could just not seem to do right. And, and it's amazing, if you read these kings, it's fascinating, the book of Kings, it's Seven. Because king after king after king after king, you read them. I remember Asa, I think, was one of the good kings. You have a good king, he'll die, his son will be a bad king. You have a bad king, you got a good king. And, and, and I think the moral to that story is that when Israel rejected God as their leader, and wanted a man king, they began to suffer the consequences of that particular decision. And so, remember, we, we serve a sovereign God. We can go to Him, we can pray to Him, and we can serve Him, and we can love Him. And so let us be thankful that we have God to turn to our own Christian lives. Brother, Brother Glenn, would you lead us in a closing prayer, please? <clears throat>